that getting behind what you're doing. And so I guess my question to you is, I mean, how do you see that kind of channel these days? Is, you know, could you see a band getting a national following and doing well if they didn't have Triple J support? Or, you know, how do you see, a, you know, a, a national radio network in terms of the current either enablers or constraints around creating interest in a band? See, I think if, if you've got a massive national fan base and you're the kind of music that suits Triple J, it will eventually be played. Like, you won't be able to pick a band that didn't supposedly break through Triple J because once you get to that level, I, I don't think... I think sometimes, yeah, radio will jump on and, and help to break a band, but radio follow just as much as they lead. Scott, what do you think about that? I mean, you're mixing records. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, to radio. I work in two ways. I mean, I think Triple J's great because it is an outlet for music. But, you know, the question was, does, does Triple J actually shape the, the scene? Does it, you know, I mean, I've heard of countless young bands taking their stuff in to Triple J and then, and then not playing it you know, because of the style of, of music that it is. Um, so, you know, there's a question there. I mean, is it up to... Kings Mill and, and the guys at Triple J to to have that you know a monopoly on what's being played on the most popular station around Australia. I guess you know, and, and that sort of raises the issue of when you've got a single station, how many particular angles or genres or approaches can that one station cater to? And so, by definition, it's a self-limiting channel because no, despite the most altruistic motives of any particular programmer. If you had a completely different track, you know, there's there's a sense that they will create a house style. Um, perhaps the best that you could approach would be specialist shows. Yeah, and that's um, right. That they, would they do feature. That. So if you play post rock, you're going to get played at three in the morning. That's right. That's you right. know, and if you play, you know, uh, radio friendly pop, you might make the breakfast shift if it's long as it's less than four minutes. Well, that's you know, right. And that's what they. That, that's the the time when most people are listening. That's you know. So that's what they're designing, is yeah. those moments. So I guess then the question would then come to like public radio. I mean, in the US, I mean, the College Network is kind of well known as a, as a sort of a platform for breaking bands, and people look to the College Network as being a network yeah. where a buzz can go around the network from one station to another, and you know, it operates as a kind of a network. In Australia, would you see public radio as being um, an equivalent, or do you think there are differences or is it less operating as a network any views on that well there's definitely a need for it but and, and um, people seem to have enthusiasm for them but they just can't keep them going yeah. you know I mean FBI is struggling to SER you know we've, we've seen them I mean that's just Sydney so I'd, I'd also question the rose-colored glasses that we always look at American college radio with without necessarily having been there and lived it I mean ever it might have a better a better opinion but I mean you know I think everyone's thing in their head where they can hit college radio and all of a sudden break the states I think you know well, it's, it's probably worth a little more investigating well, 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 as a concept look, I mean, as well the college radio the United States has a couple more people living in it than Australia doesn't it that's right. mm. yeah. well and that's but one of the, so an interesting point of comparison then throwing back to you Everett on this is that you know up until fairly recently in the UK which had a very, very big population. You know, BBC Radio 1 was this sort of monolithic thing that sat across the entire music industry in the UK. Um, even the, the BBC didn't even have much music video. You know, you had Top of the Pops and you had... So going back in time, you know, um, what's interesting around, say, the UK as opposed to the US is that it had a very large population but a very constrained set of channels around breaking bands. I mean... Um, Oh, and, and then also, prior to the internet, the NME and Melody Maker in the print space being their sort of monolithic kind of pipes. I mean, yeah, yeah, but then, but but then the geography starts to come into place, and the size and the size of the country starts to really matter. And then, you know, the fact that you can get in a uh, in a van and tour anywhere you like in in a day and do a couple of places if you like, like the Beatles used to. Beatles used to play two or three places a night, I believe. Um, then, then that comes into play. You know, you can't do that in Australia. It's not possible. Um, I mean, just just touching on your um, point about um, Triple J, whether they pick up on a band if there is a buzz. 
you know, if it's possible to generate that without Triple J, I'd like to reinforce what Stephen said there. If Triple J is doing their job at all, and clearly they are doing their job because they're immensely popular, then they will have picked up on that band at some point along in the, in, in the lifespan of that buzz, because otherwise Triple J would not exist. There's plenty of bands that, that are staple Triple J bands that, that everyone assumes they jumped on right at the start, and it's not necessarily the case. I mean, I remember working on the first Butterfly Effect record um, and pitching that to Triple J, and there was, there was no love for that. And it took six months of plugging and showing them that there was a scene building and that there was a need for it, and that, you know, that it, really, the, you know, they were touring, they were selling out places, and you had to build the story for them. It wasn't a, you know, there was not a god sitting there that went, aha, this is a hit. It, it was the same as anything. You had to build the story and, and the band and the vibe, that won over the radio station, not the other way around. So I guess one of the, you know, questions that's begging to be asked around, you know, that particular channel is that, uh, you know, it's often debated, um, you know, particularly with Australia, uh, sometimes bands become, sometimes Australian bands become popular in Australia after they've been ignored by Australia and they've been picked up by the rest of the world. Sometimes bands are able to make it, you know, to get a momentum in Australia and then break into overseas markets. I mean, do you think um, that the limitations around, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, having, Scott was talking before about a band turning up to Triple J with a recent release and being told that it didn't fit the format or the orientation or focus of the station, would you at that point be saying to a band, well, listen, you guys actually need to, you know, take this overseas, find stations that are going to play this, and just stop thinking about Australia for a moment and just start thinking more globally? Is that something that you would be saying? Well, sure, but I think that now it's the internet. I mean, the internet's there and, you know... Um um, you know, collecting fans and, and using the internet as a tool to find where your, your music sits is, is a successful way of, you know, getting it out there. I mean, maybe even more so than radio. I mean, definitely, you know. Well, that's an interesting point, and I might throw it to Everett on that one because he's been conducting a few experiments in this space recently. Uh, this idea of creating buzz around music blogs or hanging out around music blogs. So, okay, you know, um, uh, interesting phenomenon recently in Australia. So who the hell dot net would be an interesting example of a bunch of people doing, you know, what starts off as an amateur blog that then becomes a, a channel which people start to pay attention to, and then so now exposure on who the hell dot net might be seen as being a good place to be. Yeah. Um, to what extent do you think that um, the music blog community plays a role in creating a buzz around the band? I mean, you know, w w what are your perceptions so far? What was that term you used earlier about describing local in a... Translocal. Translocal, thank you. Well, it's all to do with um, creating a, a translocal buzz, isn't it? It's like back 20 years ago, you know, when Nirvana first started, it was important that they um, got to be on their label, got to be with Sub Pop, got to be part of the Seattle scene, you know, for, formed um, allegiances... Um, and networks with, with similar like-minded people in their area. Now it's all about um, creating that on a trans-local um, scene, uh, on a trans-local um, scale. So it's very important to, to create that buzz via a network, a social network, whichever the best way of doing that is. And that is normally the same way that you've always created. The, the traditional way to create a buzz is to find a bunch of enthusiastic people and get them to do your work for you, because you can't do it by yourself, you're too small. So you get your, your bunch of enthusiastic people to go out and spread the word for you. So you used to do that on a local level because that was easy. Now you do it on a translocal le level and, and to do that you go via blogs, you go via Facebook, you, you make sure you, you slap your music up on MySpace even before you've played a gig. Um, you go via Twitter and, and that's how you create your buzz. 